Okay, um, this is my new workplace. Um, just, uh, this is the, the layout of the presentation I'm going to give you. So I do some groundwork first. Then I talk about the institutional bibliography, I'll explain you a little bit later about this. Then the services you can develop on top of institutional uh, bibliographies. Then I'm so excited I have to wind down and give you some take-home messages. Um, previously I worked at uh, Wageningen UR uh, Library. Uh, not all of you might be aware of uh, the great city Wageningen in the Netherlands. Only Peter Schiffer uh, uh, describing uh, University of Illinois uh, Urbana Champaign uh, might be familiar with it because we are closely re resembling a land grant university. Wageningen was selected by farmers in the Netherlands to st uh, 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 start an agricultural college somewhere in the 1800s, uh, far away from good infrastructure and these kind of things, so the young men couldn't run into any trouble. That's where we are, so we are the only Dutch university not having a railway station. We have a food and nutrition department, so we're the only university uh, uh, city in the Netherlands that doesn't have a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was responsible for the research support team, and that started uh, uh, way back. Um, uh, my passion was in bibliometric analysis, actually quantitative analysis. By training, I'm a tropical crop uh, specialist. I did my studies on cocoa and oil palms, lived in Indonesia, these kind of things. An information poor environment, that always triggered my interest in information. So after a few years of being in a kind of postdoc uh, position, going from contract to contract, I was offered an, uh, uh, a job in the university library uh, with uh, a possibility of a fixed contract and having two small children, that's an uh, interesting uh, position. So I never regretted the change, actually. Um, we started really research support on the basis of bibliometrics, and of course nowadays we are involved in, in uh, data management uh, as well. Um, a, a month and a half ago I started at uh, uh, Vrije Universiteit, the Free University of Amsterdam, not to be uh, um, uh, mixed up with the University of Amsterdam. There are two universities in Amsterdam, and I'm at this one. Um, well, that's what they say, they say digital library systems, metadata service and innovation. So actually, I'm actually the back end of the, um, uh, of the library, whereas I used to be in Wageningen really uh, the front end of the library. I, I used to interact a lot with uh, uh, library staff, so I have to adapt myself in, to this new position as well. Um, next slide up. Um, I was amazed that I met the man. Uh, um, I, I've been quoting him uh, quite some time, Clifford Lynch, and I want to quote him on, on this one. That digital libraries is, is an oxymoronic uh, phrase, but the, the, the last sentence is really important. Librarians, though some would argue digital libraries have very little to do with libraries as institutions or the practice of librarianship. And I want to show you, and I hope you will agree by the end of this presentation, that going to invest in an institutional bibliography in, uh, uh, is, is actually a step towards digital libraries where you can do things yourself. I mean, libraries, the classical role of libraries has been buying content from publishers and making it available to our users. But by buying content, we are also tied with our hands and feet to all kinds of clauses and regulations and these kind of things. If you build your institutional uh, bibliography, if you know what they produce, you have at least some entitlements to uh, their rights. We can uh, uh, argue a lot about uh, uh, the right place of the copyrights because our uh, authors actually sign it away to publishers happily. Uh, they don't even blink. Um, you can also argue did the publishers actually sign the contract with the right person? Because if you look in Dutch uh, uh, copyright law, it's the employer of the uh, uh, researcher who actually is entitled to the rights of the research output and not the researcher himself. Of course, the university is afraid to touch upon the subject of academic freedom, so it will remain in this, uh, uh, well, opaque state, I would say. But at least when you build an institutional uh, uh, bibliography, you are entitled to some rights. That's, that's an important point to make uh, uh, to start with. Um, 
The situation in uh, the Netherlands is that uh, all Dutch universities have a current, spelling mistake, sorry, uh, research information system, a TRIS. Uh, all universities used to uh, uh, use uh, METIS, which was uh, um, a, a current research information system built by the University of Nijmegen, the uh, uh, um, IT department there. Uh, and now all the, um, and that has really uh, uh, become at the end of its life cycle, it needed to be renewed. And now um, uh, all universities, except for Nijmegen itself of course, they are uh, switching to either pure or convergence. Symplectic is not in, the, uh, in, in, in that game there because Symplectic was at the moment of the decision of all universities a little bit too simple for the needs of universities because it had to interact with also the administrative systems uh, uh, and the project management systems and the various systems uh, uh, in the, within the university uh, environment and uh, uh, pure and converse have proven to be capable of, of doing these kind of things. The other important part of the whole uh, uh, um, uh, gamut is actually uh, that all universities have an open access repository. And there we get into a difficult uh, definition because when you talk with librarians or with open access advocates about uh, repository, they only think about open access repositories. Um, in my view, a repository is actually uh, the shopping window of the university to the rest of the world to show what their output is and everything should be in there. So whether it's open access or only the metadata. Um, so there is some difference in, 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 in opinion about an open access repository or a repository. So that's why I talk about an institutional bibliography. Um, uh, and all Dutch open access repositories are harvested actually by uh, Marxist, the overarching uh, open access repository of the Netherlands. And some universities have only strictly open access material in there, and other universities uh, have uh, also metadata and, and references to what they actually uh, produce. The previous university where I worked uh, was one of those universities having everything in there, and now I uh, have joined a, a university where I have to go and change these kind of things because they only have, by the strict definition, only open access material uh, available in the uh, repository. And actually, I have already buy-in from uh, uh, the university staff, the dean's office, to, to go ahead with this change. But uh, the shift over to another uh, current research information is actually uh, uh, taking priority over the, the next steps in, in, in these uh, matters. Okay, just to look at uh, a situation at Wageningen, the CRIS is actually for us the back end uh, of the whole thing. Uh, the institutional uh, bibliography is the uh, front end. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, that uh, display window of Wageningen output. I show you. No, that's just a link. Can I go live? Do I have internet access on this thing? No. Okay. Then you have to do it with dull numbers. Um, we have currently in, uh, um, well, we, we register some 10,000 uh, at my previous university. You, you see the logo uh, changing so now and then. So this is uh, referring to the situation at Wageningen. Um, and there we have some 10,000 registrations uh, uh, per year in the, uh, in the CRIS. And only 33%, that's an optimistic view actually, uh, uh, can be traced to uh, systems like Web of Science or Scopus. Scopus is a little bit more than Web of Science, but it's only 33%. Uh, so there's still another 70% out there which you have to enter manually, get from all the systems. Uh, currently we have some 240,000 registration, of which uh, 74,000 are uh, already open access, 33,000 are total access, and we have a large paper trail. And that goes back to, we want to move back to uh, include all scholarly output of our institution since 1918. It was an idea of mine. Uh, I, I left the university before I could complete it. 1980, uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 80, 80, 10. Uh, we were, uh, um, became a university and in three years time, we exist 100 years. So what's better than having a nice present and, and uh, present all the output there in, in the system. There was actually a rationale behind it. Because our librarian said, 
we go and digitize all our output, or all our output, the most important of our output. Okay, but if you don't know what your output is, what is the best output you're going to uh, um, uh, digitize? So you have to make an inventory first of all your output before you actually can do a selection. Well, that's my reasoning behind it. And I got a lot of uh, buy-in, and so we started this thing, and then having the 100 year uh, uh, coming up, it was also a good idea to uh, put it in that way. And really, one of the things I, I miss most is, is working on this project, because it, it really was my pet project. But well, I have a better job and uh, also nice challenges. This is um, 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 the, the, the thing it has a lot of uh, uh, boxes and connections, etc. The, the, the point of this uh, slide is that Matis is there, which is actually the back end of the system. Here, uh, various things are there. And this is called Wageningen Yield. We are agriculture, so yield is a good uh, term. And that's the front end shown to the world everything in. And of course, it's a no brainer that all the information here goes also uh, to the uh, uh, annual scientific report, it goes to the publication list of staff on their website. Uh, that's a no-brainer. That's so easy, uh, we do that. It also goes into uh, 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 OAA uh, uh, harvesting for open access uh, things. So Oyster is, is harvesting everything of us. Uh, one of the nice things is everything the, the university produces, and that's important for an, an, an agricultural-oriented uh, university, is also going to AGIS, the FAO bibliography of uh, um, uh, scientific information in uh, uh, agricultural sciences, life sciences, and these kind of things. So there are a lot of different outputs from that. But the starting point is complete registration. Um, here you uh, see some slides I want to show you live, but uh, luckily I, 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 I had them uh, uh, pre-cooked already. Um, you see there's an increase, 12, 000, nearly 13,000 uh, here, and now there's a, a decline. That is because uh, um, uh, the institutes attached or connected to the university um, uh, really have a, a, a tough time at the moment and they are laying off people, researchers, uh, um, uh, because financing is uh, uh, drying up and that you see it immediately reflected in, um, uh, in output. If you actually go into the detail of this output, then you will see that um, uh, peer-reviewed scholarly articles will remain stable and they don't have time to uh, work on the lesser important material. But there's still a lot, lot out there. To give you an impression, um, um, formal output, formal scholarly output uh, of those 239 is 187, well, 190,000. Uh, most of them are uh, refereed articles, followed by reports. We produce an awful lot uh, of reports at our university because the research institutes have this policy type of, of work, so there's a lot of grey literature going out, and because it's taken up by the library and sits in the repository, it's also distributed, disseminated to the rest of the world. Um, I mentioned here uh, refereed articles, this part, and here it says articles, but these are actually articles in uh, uh, trade journals, vocational journals, uh, the Farmers Weekly, and, and these kind of things. Because we are comparable to a land-grant university, there's still a lot of uh, um, extension services going on. Uh, it's the classical task of the university. So there's a lot of practical information uh, processed into a, a way it can be digested by the farmers and, and put into the practice. It's, it's a really an applied uh, uh, university. And it's an important part. And the interesting thing is that in the Netherlands, this part is actually becoming now more important because um, uh, public outreach uh, um, societal impact becomes more important. So all these registrations are helping the university to prove that they are doing that. And these registrations are not to be found in Scopus, they are not to be found in Web of Science or PubMed or whatever system. You have to chase or you have to get a system in place to catch all this output. And then the, the last part of it, it's, it's the other output, uh, uh, a lot of abstracts presented at conferences, all kinds of activities, it can be uh, videos, it can be uh, uh, all kinds of things. Data sets are coming up now, editorships, uh, lectures you've given, uh, all these kind of things. Interesting thing is that at Wageningen we try to cover all the, the staff, and so a lecture like I'm giving now, 
uh, would be entered in our system. Um, when I went to, I've given two presentations in my new uh, position already, and I went to my repository uh, uh, manager who reports to me, and I said, I want to have an entry for personal maintenance so I can enter my stuff into the system. And he looked at me and he said, why? Your, your library staff, you're not producing any scientific output. Well, he didn't get it really, but I'm going to change that. And I, the task of the library is actually to catch everything of the, uh, 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 in output of the university, and not only of faculty. It is faculty, staff, supporting staff. They all have various roles in outreach for your uh, university. This actually ties in neatly with the day of yesterday, and I, I just wanted to dazzle you with that you can do so much more. You have to understand that we started in 1975 with uh, research uh, registration, and you have to take a long time to get a comprehensive registration. With the research institutes, we started in 1995, and now we're walking, uh, working our way back. But it takes time for take-up and buy-in uh, by the staff, but they have been educated now for such a long time that there is a large uh, 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 um, adherence to the policy, really. Um, if you have this set of data, having this set of data and sitting on it is not sufficient. I mean, it's only where it starts. I call it the groundwork. That's what you have, need to have in order. Then you can do the fun stuff. And actually, that's really strange that I left my university where we can do so, so much fun stuff and I go to a university um, um, uh, where I have to start with the groundwork again. But I explain later uh, uh, when winding down uh, what it is. So I want to give a, a couple of examples uh, of all these subjects. I have to stay in, in sync with the time. Um, uh, advanced bibliometric indicators. I started already in 2003, 2004 with uh, uh, research assessments or bibliometric analyses for groups and, and these kind of things. Was born also uh, 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 just inquisitiveness. I want to see how our collection was being used and these kind of things. So we recently acquired Web of Science and we get, got essential science indicators. So I was asked if I could do a research report for a group. Normally, they, they would have gone to uh, an institution in the Netherlands, the CWTS. They are specialized in uh, bibliometric analyses, but they charge you also a lot of money. And, and they challenged me, could I do it on a similar way as C CWTS uh, would do, comparable at least, not exactly the same standards, and uh, save them a, 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 a bit of money. Well, it was extra money for the library as well to do this. Um, and I got to go ahead from my boss and, 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 and from then on it, it started playing, uh, uh, became more and more regular. It became so big that in 2008 we had to evaluate five graduate schools at the same time. Uh, that means something like 80% of our, actually were six graduate schools, means about 60% of the, 80% of the staff uh, were going to be evaluated. So I couldn't uh, uh, do that anymore. Uh, on the basis of Access and Excel, we needed to uh, uh, get the system in, in place. At that time, we didn't have insights, we didn't have a uh, um, um, we had to build it ourselves. You didn't have Pure, you didn't have uh, uh, um, uh, Converus or uh, Symplectic, we had to build it ourselves. Um, so we implemented the whole system uh, on top of the uh, institutional bibliography. And indeed, we limited ourselves in these kind of analyses only to those publications you can actually trace back to the Web of Science. Um, and we used essential science indicators. Scopus, at that moment, didn't have uh, baseline data, so we couldn't normalize it. Well, we could buy in Scopus as a whole and then do the uh, normalization of all the uh, information as well, but that we felt was a bit uh, overstretching the whole thing. We are not a research department and having vast resources. We have to do it in a practical way. Um, but the nice thing about implementing it on the uh, uh, institutional bibliography is uh, it allows us to slice and dice the research impact any way we wish. Um, we can make it an, an, an impact uh, dashboard for any subject, any person, any uh, research unit, any graduate school uh, at any time. Um, and we, we actually show uh, three different sections of reporting on the bibliometric analysis. 
For the time being, it's based on level science and, and essential science indicators, and we are switching over to, uh, um, uh, well, we, we are investigating the possibilities of SIFAL or insights. And in the Netherlands, we have also, well, actually worldwide, you have the option to go to uh, um, CW3S and buy the impact monitor from them. They also have an, uh, all kinds of routines on uh, the basis of Web of Science data, and they uh, uh, are allowed to sell that as a service to uh, universities. I can imagine that uh, science metrics from Canada uh, are going to develop a service like that, and, and probably there are more uh, players on the market coming on. Um, what I want to stress in the last uh, uh, link is um, um, what is always important when you do these things is transparency. So we always link all the analyses to the original metadata of all the publications involved. And actually, if I go into the products of Insights and Saival, that same level of transparency is not available. And I always, I happen to be advising both Thomson Reuters as well as Elsevier on these subjects because we are so long in this area of research already and I try to convince them that this is of utmost importance for buying uh, from staff uh, but still they don't entirely understand this message. Um, just to show you an example of a group, um, in, over the past couple of years they had 450 publications uh, N is the number of publications, and you see it's underlined here, so I can click on this uh, uh, number, and all those 237 publications are actually shown. And you see that this group actually has most of their output in the agricultural sciences and in the environment ecology. If you're a bit in the, in the game of uh, bibliometric analysis, you recognize that these are the, the larger subject areas of the essential science indicators from Thomson Reuters. Um, the total citation, world average, sites per, per paper, and then this is the important one, the relative impact. So normalized for the world impact in their field. So in this area, they're 2.3 times above the world average, whereas in environment and ecology, they're 2.06 times above the world average. So in this area, they're doing slightly better than here. And looking at the uh, share of top 10% most cited publications, it's just the opposite uh, around. The number is larger here, but uh, the share is uh, slightly smaller. Um, and this is then the top 1%, it's a slightly less nice indicator. I, I find these two indicators the most useful. And if you go, for instance, to uh, a university ranking, probably not well known, but the Leiden ranking in the Netherlands, very well known. Leiden University is CWTS, sits in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, they, have, uh, uh, they have been using nowadays the share of 10% most cited publications as their main indicator uh, for competition. We also give for the same group an, a chronological overview and an interesting one that came up uh, in, in the recent past is actually looking at publication success. Because here you see the journal portals based on the journal citation reports. So quartal 1 are the top 25% in your subject area, quartal 2, quartal 3 and 4. And what you, what's important here, the majority of their output is in these areas, followed by uh, 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 quartal 2, 3 and 4. But look at the impact, what a dramatic effect this has on their uh, success in uh, uh, citation scores, in, in achieving impact. Here it's 2.72, 1.5, 107, and it's below world average. And here, look at the share of unsighted pu publications. Of course, there are four here and seven there, but the share is still 17% of the 23. Uh, this one really, when we made this report, this one really amazed me. I knew there was a the time difference that played a role. She ate in my presentation, really. Um, and um, that report came out of the, the, the tenure track report where the library is responsible of calculating the, the, the research credits. So if you are involved in tenure track, you have to go to the library, make use of the system, so everything should be reported within the system, and you get your points on the basis of, of uh, the publication you have. And actually, you get only points if you publish in quarter one and quarter two journals. And I can show you as, uh, uh, as well that it's really effective for us as a university to have this policy because over the years we have been monitoring this, the impact of the university as a whole is going up, up and up. So if I show this to the, the, the these graph to the rector, the tenure track policy will be there to stay for another uh, couple of years. One of the things, uh, 
Okay, this was uh, the really hobby horse, and now I'm going to other services that are interesting as well. Um, we have been issuing ISBNs for uh, uh, theses for a long time already. That is mean classical library stuff, really. But we should switch over to minting DOIs, because in my uh, view, ISBNs are a broken system. Um, for one book, you have multiple uh, ISBNs, uh, depending on geographical uh, areas, whether it has a paperback or a hardback. But the stuff inside is still the same, so I don't get it. So DOI, one single link that actually resolves to a, 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 a thing, it's, it's really uh, uh, important. And think about all the great literature we produce, all the reports. Uh, it makes them better citable, and the metadata are fed back in Crossref, and that in, uh, uh, encourages discoverability again. So it is a self-enforcing uh, 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 mechanism. Um, and you have to feed back the metadata into Crossref. You have the metadata already sitting in your repository, so it's actually uh, uh, a new service on top of your repository, and it's nicely uh, uh, suited in that area. We're making small steps into altmetrics as well, and uh, especially at the university uh, where I'm now at, where we have a humanities department, where we have a lot of social sciences. Um, it, measures, uh, in, you, you have impact measures beyond the classical uh, Web of Science and Scopus covered publications, uh, and you have a wide range of uptakes, um, so it is ideally suited to also get some uh, additional measures in all areas. Um, the issue is that are you going to buy something off the shelf, or are you going to use the APIs that are being developed, Mendeley has APIs, Crossref has APIs, uh, uh, PLOS has APIs, so there are many different sources and this is really where you go and explore and see what's possible and, and, and suit your own need. Um, something about thesis in the Netherlands, uh, quite different from the situation here in the United States. In the Netherlands, uh, certainly at my uh, previous university, uh, um, a thesis is actually a collection of articles. And there is a big emphasis nowadays in the Netherlands on open access publishing. Uh, and we try to look for the formal versions of open access publications and, and our Ministry of Education actually loves to go for gold. Uh, it's called open access because it costs you gold dollars uh, uh, to pay for it. Um, and here we have uh, uh, theses and this example actually uh, consists of uh, uh, eight chapters. Introduction and a summary are uh, um, uh, actually hardly ever published as an article. But the other six articles are. And at the time of defense of his thesis, uh, he had already four published articles in his thesis. One was accepted uh, by a journal, and one was in preparation. And you can, the, the new task of the library is actually to link back all these original articles to this thesis, where you can find, at a chapter level, that same content as an open access version. Actually, Google Scholar does it for us already. But we need to learn the trick from Google Scholar, so I'm staying on till tomorrow and listen to uh, Anurag. Um, and, and a nice statistics for you uh, to know is that the average PhD student in Wageningen in the uh, food sciences starts out with the idea of publishing five and a half articles per thesis, and he succeeds in, in publishing four and a half articles. They are actually responsible for uh, more than half of the uh, article output of the university. Um, another thing I want to touch upon, I, I'm, I'm really needing a little bit more time. Um, I was really amazed that uh, uh, the National Science Foundation came up with the thing that they were going to build a dark archive. And I really go and encourage all libraries to do that and follow that example. Um, because if you have that dark archive, you can do text mining on that. You can uh, um, um, full text searching, uh, all kinds of possibilities. So if you say that it's safe with the publisher, but you have difficulty of getting the content from the publisher. Yeah, if you go into the publisher's own systems, but if you want to uh, 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 showcase what your uh, um, uh, university is capable of, you need to full text mine that, get knowledge out of that, and present it in, in some way. So you, you need to have that dark archive there as well. You don't show the actual content, but then you point them to where the content is to be found. But you need the actual content to do this analysis before you can actually present it. So there are many, many uh, 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 challenges and, 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 and really interesting uh, uh, um, opportunities to, to be had with a, a repository. 
Um, one example is if you go in our catalog and you look at the journals, this is the order that you get the journals listed. So PLOS is at the top, Nature and Science is, is there, and then Applied and Environmental uh, Microbiology, and at the bottom is uh, the Journal of Dairy Science. Then I know for sure I am at Wageningen University. Because these are the most cited journals by our staff. And actually we rank all the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, journals on their importance, which is actually citations. And why did we do that? Well, we needed that because from a, a, a publisher as Springer, we get a single bill for the whole of the university. And then the bickering starts about who used what of Springer. So we did this analysis of who is using what part of the collection and use the citation analysis as a, as a proof of usage of your journals, you're actually citing it. So we know you're using it. So citations is an important way, of, or references are an important way of splitting up the bill we get from Springer, Wiley, et cetera, et cetera. So collection analysis is actually, and because it's tied in the current research information system, we can say this, this article was used by this person and he was citing this material. That connection is important to make. Here I showed for the whole library, of, for all of the university, but we can actually zoom into detail. It's of course no interest of, of what an individual is actually citing in these kind of things, but it, is, uh, it gives you interesting uh, uh, information. The next thing is that um, um, in the Netherlands there's a fierce debate on whether or not to continue with Elsevier. And so we needed to provide alternatives as well. So we needed to recommend journals to our staff. So we had to build a journal recommender. So what we did is actually uh, analyzed uh, 18,490 articles uh, from the period 2016-2013, analyzed all their 800,000 references in this uh, 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 collection, and whether this is big data or not, but um, it is a pretty uh, uh, amazing uh, amount of references. And most of these references are, of course, to the journal articles. 88% uh, of these are uh, journal articles. And uh, then the next thing what you can do is a co-citation analysis. So article A uh, is citing these three journals. And article B is citing a, a number of journals. Article C is citing that as well. And then here you see that this uh, 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 journal has been cited three times, this one twice, once, twice, and twice. So you get an import feeling of importance of journals. And if you look, for instance, at the Journal of Agricultural Systems, um, we see that it's co-cited the most with Agricultural Ecosystems and Environment, with Field Crop Research, European Journal of Agronomy, Journal of Dairy Science, Science, etc. This is if you look at the whole university. But if you now go zoom into a science group, like for instance animal science, look at the top five for instance, then agricultural science is cited most in agricultural science, okay. But now at once, because we are talking about animal sciences, the Journal of Dairy Science comes at the top, agricultural ecosystems was at the top, but now livestock production systems uh, becomes fourth, and Journal of Animal Science. So for a different group of users, the same journal is used in a different connotation. Um, when I showed this to some researchers, they said, can I have that top 10? They really want to have it immediately. It, and that was for me the proof that if we implement this on top of the, uh, 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 the journal uh, system we have, I showed you before already, that if you are interested in this journal, you might be interested in these, these, and these as well. So just show them the top five. And if you're actually from this department, you better focus on these five rather than these five. So then you have a, a form of personalization as well, not going into a too detailed uh, level. I know, I know. Um, if you are really interested in, uh, in this more, my colleague from Wageningen did uh, uh, last week in Paris a presentation on that, so uh, SlideshareNet, he, he explains it all how, how this works. One minute for winding down, okay. Um, what I wanted to show you, and I hope I, I, I've convinced you that based on your own output, there are many possibilities to uh, develop new services. That's really what we are all uh, about. Um, I mean, collection development, interesting, nice, but collection development in actual practice is that it's going to bulk buy-in of packages of electronic books, of electronic journals, and, and these kind of things. So collection 
uh, analysis, uh, co co uh, collection development is not so important anymore. Face it or not, but that's the reality. So we need to develop new services, and, and these are just a few examples uh, you can do. Um, I have been lucky that I've always been in a uh, situation that the current research information system and the repository are in hands of the library, and I think that's a natural place for a repository and a current research information system uh, uh, to be, because the majority is about bibliographic data and metadata. And who are the experts on that? I'm not an educated librarian, but we as librarians are uh, experts on metadata. So it should be there. Um, uh, we are professionally trained in the subject matter. Of course, I'm talking about new services. Um, uh, Keith was mentioning this already as well. New services require new skill sets. I teach it myself and, and developed it by, by studying the literature, but there are easier ways, go to courses and, and these kind of things. It, it's really important to develop your staff uh, uh, to, to be able to work with these new realities. Um, apart from the CWTS course in, in, in uh, Europe, there's also a European summer school on bibliometrics. Um, so, uh, from knowledge uh, on the publication behavior and the impact of your research groups and, and, and researchers, you have sufficient information to tell compelling stories. And it's storytelling that's really important. And I've been in the lucky position that doing these kind of things you get invited as well by groups to come and explain the results. And from there on, you, you start to think with them on what should they improve and how can they improve. And so you become the master on, on that subject. Um, uh, so it's also a formal part of information skills training for PhDs and postdocs and, and all kinds of things. Actually, in, interesting question, just a small question. Who do you think the groups are that come first to the library after they have received an, an impact report? What kind of groups? The frontrunners or the laggards? The frontrunners, the best groups come to you because they want to, to maintain to be the best and to beat the next competition and, and stay at the top. And whereas I thought that the weaker groups would, would come first, no, the, the best groups came first. What can we do to improve? Ah, yep. You're doing excellent already, so what do you worry? No, but we can improve. It really is, is, is the case. So, um, uh, courses on publication strategy, publication ethics, peer review, the, these all came out of, 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 of that kind of work. And then the graduate schools were really our partner in that, and the graduate schools in Wageningen have a really important role in, in, in setting the research policy as well. And from then on, we want to, in, uh, to, to wander into data management. So, the graduate schools were our natural partner, and we succeeded in, in getting an, a policy on um, uh, um, uh, data management plans for PhD students and, and things. But that's because we had proven that we had knowledge on this kind of things and uh, we were a respected partner within the university. And, and that's why, uh, uh, well, we are seen as an important and trusted partner. So, take home messages, start small, gain experience, show you're capable of doing it, be transparent, and make researchers your ambassador of your work. That's really important. And this is where my presentation ends. Thank you.